Sirens blared, and the loud ringing of the emergency alarm system gave everyone a scare, like something had jumped out at them unexpectedly. With that fright came a sharp jolt of adrenaline. Something wasn't right, and their options were either to await instructions or try and flee with their lives. Most took the latter, dropping their shovels and various mining tools so they could turn heel and bolt to the nearest opening. Outside. If they could just get outside, above ground where the air was a little clearer, then they could avoid whatever it was that was happening. But for Yuri, escape wasn't an option. He had to do something. It had been a standard operation. Everything had been run by the books and was going all the smoother for it. But that noble approach hadn't stopped the drill from breaching into a cavern, carving through stone into a previously undiscovered area. That, on its own, wasn't enough to cause concern. It was the sudden cave-in that had triggered the alarms and led to the ensuing panic. At the controls of the gigantic excavation machine, Yuri helplessly pulled at levers and pressed buttons, desperately trying to undo the rapidly worsening damage. But it was too late. Rocks and debris were showering from above, like the earth itself was retaliating against the mining workers. It was as if they shouldn't have drilled that deep. The cave in almost like they had awakened something. Unfortunately for Yuri, a falling slab of stone made sure he wouldn't get to see exactly what. The dust settled shortly after, but only one recorded casualty, along with multiple injured mine workers, wasn't enough to deter them from exploring what they had accidentally stumbled upon. Venturing into the cavern system pierced by the drill, those who first dared to set foot down there were greeted by the sight of strange, crudely built stone structures. Someone had been here before, but how? Nothing could survive this far below ground, nothing living, nothing human at least. And that was true, given that the workers also came across something else in their initial exploration, human remains. Of course, this raised quite a concern, prompting the workers to try and contact their superiors. Uncovering bodies wasn't exactly uncommon for anyone whose job it was to dig into the ground, so they at least had a protocol in place for this kind of situation. What none of them were prepared for, however, was the fiery abomination that suddenly emerged as they were trying to call for help. The creature was a nightmarish blend of a humanoid shape, with the head of a dog and giant wings much like a bat's. Covered in rough fur, its body was exuding an oily, flammable substance, which it used to incinerate the surviving mine workers in an instant. By the time that operatives of the SCP Foundation arrived on scene in the town of Mirni within the Saka Republic, the creature was on a rampage. Buildings were collapsing as the winged beast set the nearby area ablaze. Troops on the ground, even once they were able to get the monster in range, found that their conventional weapons were useless. It cost the lives of 17 mobile task force operatives, all immolated down to a cinder, before a chopper was able to neutralize the creature. With the threat destroyed and the town administered with amnestics and fed a convincing cover story, you'd think that was case closed on a job well done. But the Foundation discovered within the nearby Mirni mine something that would completely change everything they thought they knew. Deep underground was a sinkhole, leading to a spatial anomaly below, consisting of the system of caverns that the mine workers had inadvertently stumbled upon. That wasn't all that the Foundation was about to discover down there, and what they came across would soon become one of their darkest secrets, SCP-3667. It wasn't long before the Foundation began encountering other unusual creatures that seemingly appeared in the vicinity of SCP-3667. However, not all of them matched the description of the original bat-winged, dog-headed, pyromaniacal visitor, officially dubbed as instances of SCP-3667-1. These creatures ranged from the aforementioned monstrosity to a whole host of other strange descriptions. One was an abnormally thin humanoid creature with reddish-brown skin and a head that was too big for its wiry body. It possessed an ordinary human level of intelligence and even spoke modern Russian, matching the common local dialect. In conversation, this being tried to offer wealth or power in exchange for a person's most valued possessions. However, it seemed to possess no anomalous abilities and would attempt to renegotiate a new offer immediately after a bargain was made. 
Then there were the Magistrates, a group of 48 humanoids with kyphotic curved spines. All of them wore furs and a variety of skulls from animals such as elks, deer, and moose. The Foundation were still none the wiser as to the true origin of all these different subspecies of creatures. They were obviously emanating from the sinkhole, and the Foundation had been making use of MTF Chi-5, codenamed Solomon's Seals, to eliminate instances of SCP-3667-1 that appeared from below. Surface-to-air missile systems were even installed nearby, should any more flying creatures appear. But further exploration into the sinkhole and the caverns below would only yield further questions and even more strange entities. The four-person unit MTF Chi-5 Team-1 was sent in to conduct preliminary exploration into SCP-3667 to try and assess more accurately the threat level posed by the sinkhole and its bizarre residents. Finding themselves in a large cave, the team followed the sounds of running water to a wide stream, the water a yellowish-gray in coloration. They also detected the sound of numerous voices, all whispering in Russian, but found it too difficult to distinguish what they were saying. There were remains, too, of some kind of structure that seemed to indicate the existence of sentient life within SCP-3667. There was a portion of a wall, even a hallway, that led into a large windowless circular room. The floor of this chamber featured an elaborate mosaic that seemed to have sustained some damage. But strangely, it depicted anomalous creatures, including some that looked like the first winged monster that had appeared. After splitting up down various corridors, two members of Team 1 encountered a new entity from within SCP-3667. This creature resembled a large feline, but had no eyes and was about 10 meters in height. It referred to the MTF operatives as sinners and foolish mortals who should have stayed in their cages. Despite being eyeless, the creature observed that the team did not possess what it called the Mark of Ogniena and remarked that they should not have been there. Feeling threatened by the creature, MTF Chi-5 Team 1 was able to blow it up with a grenade before being safely retrieved by their fellow Foundation personnel. Exploration into SCP-3667 was then resumed by MTF Chi-5 Teams 2 and 3, who were alarmed to hear what sounded like a human scream coming from somewhere within the caves. While they first assumed it was another 3667-1 creature, someone suggested the possibility that a civilian could have stumbled onto the site of the Myrny Mine before the Foundation had arrived and established a secure perimeter around the sinkhole. Hearing the scream a second time, this time further away, the MTF agents decided to investigate, just in case an innocent person had been dragged underground by one of the creatures. Passing through a basin of the same strange fluid that Team 1 had discovered, the MTF teams could hear more unsettling sounds coming from deep within the caverns, in particular, a repetitive scratching noise. Next, they discovered a large, intricate wooden structure, a circle with one side that appeared to be winched open. Inside, they could see rows of wooden spikes, covered in a dark liquid that everyone assumed was blood. Hearing whimpers from their supposed missing civilian, the team's commander decided to call a retreat. It was then that the MTF realized there were over 20 more wooden structures nearby. Each was of a different shape and size, but all of them were covered in rats that were staring at the Foundation operatives. These various pieces of wooden apparatuses seemed to resemble torture devices, and some of them had bodies inside. The MTF agents thought they had discovered the grisly fate of their missing civilian. Little did they know that things were far worse than they first seemed. The bodies and the torture devices were still alive. The Foundation soon realized there were upwards of 12,000 people within SCP-3667 and immediately began efforts to rescue as many as they could. Luckily, they had established a field base on site in the mine, close enough to the sinkhole that led into SCP-3667. However, the unfortunate reality was that saving all these trapped human beings was no small undertaking, and space at their nearby base, Site-574, was limited. Only 150 of the people were able to be recovered and were transported to Site-574. Those that were having been found trying to escape from SCP-3667 were being eaten by the various nightmarish creatures below. But what quickly became apparent was that these people, those safely recovered from SCP-3667, and those still trapped within, weren't exactly ordinary. When Team 1 had discovered the strange yellow-gray stream in SCP-3667, they had collected a sample of the fluid for analysis. 
Examining this sample revealed an anomalous molecular structure that would actively bond with organic matter, and this same unidentified molecule was present in the bloodstream of the human beings found beneath the sinkhole. It seemed to have bestowed each one of them with an anomalous ability for a limited form of regeneration. Their bodies could withstand far more damage than an average non-anomalous human. The Foundation even experimented with introducing the anomalous molecule into the blood of other test subjects, but it didn't have the same regenerative effect. It was assumed that the regeneration was linked directly to some other factor, and the molecule from the fluid only acted as a catalyst. As such, every person recovered from the caverns was given the collective designation of SCP-3667-2. Now, various subspecies of strange creatures and a group of people whose bodies could regenerate, both living in a system of caverns beneath Mirni Sakha Republic, not to mention all the wooden torture devices that were being used on the SCP-3667-2s. Just what the hell was going on here? And what was it that made this discovery one of the Foundation's darkest secrets? Well, the answers to that could be discovered in what they learned next about the anomalous people they'd recovered from the sinkhole. As the Foundation continued its examination, their researchers at Site-574 happened upon a starting realization. The SCP-3667-2 people were perfect physical and genetic matches to former residents of the nearby town of Mirni. In fact, of the over 12,000 total, only 1,328 didn't appear to correspond to any known person from the area. But then, thousands of others all had proof of their existence that the Foundation was able to recover from the town's public records. Dates of birth, names, former places of residence, family, and next of kin, along with dates of death. The SCP-3667-2 instances all claim to have spent their entire lives underground, beneath the sinkhole where they were tortured endlessly by nightmarish creatures. Their bodies could regenerate the external damage they received, meaning the torture would go on for days, months, or even years at a time. When sampling bodies buried in local cemeteries, the Foundation discovered that these were in fact copies of deceased residents, but not everyone who had lived and died in Mirni. Only those whose families had lived there for at least two generations, and who, while they were alive, were suspected of committing a crime but never convicted. There was one other unifying factor, too. During their lives, these residents all had some affiliation with a particular religious group known as the Light of Five Heavens Russian Orthodox Church. To put it simply, SCP-3667 was hell. Following a number of other incursions involving SCP-3667-1 creatures, the Foundation was eventually able to open negotiations with the entities in order to ensure the continued stability of SCP-3667. The former director of Site-574, Nidai Bokomi, was appointed as the Director of Hell and placed in charge of overseeing the anomaly. Under her watch, the Foundation would supposedly be relocating the displaced SCP-3667-2s to safe, classified locations where they could be reintegrated into society. However, in an email from the Director of Hell, she proposed a solution to the Foundation's dwindling number of D-Class personnel. I am happy to announce that something has come up that changes that. I'll be sending each of you a shipment of new D-Class come next week. It isn't as many as you had hoped for, but rest assured, these ones will withstand most anything you throw at them. Now go check out SCP-3000 Anatashisha and SCP-096's Sad End for more.